Welcome to this talk by Minal Patak this morning. Um, the talk is being uh, sponsored by the Planetary History and the Anthropocene Group at the Neubauer Collegium, as well as by the university's center in Delhi, of which I'm currently the faculty director. Our guest today is Minal Patak, Dr. Minal Patak, who is based at Ahmedabad University in India. Dr. Patek is currently a senior scientist of working group three of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that is the IPCC. Working group three covers the mitigation of climate change, that is methods for reducing emissions of greenhouse gases and enhancing atmospheric sinks. The working group three technical support unit is based at the Global Center for Environment and Energy at Ahmedabad University. And, we, and it's affiliated to their Center for Environmental Policy. They are responsible for one of the three main IPCC reports due in 2021. So we are extremely lucky to have Dr. Patak speak to us about <clears throat> the IPCC's assessment of how well uh, the world is doing with regard to meeting the targets that different nations had come together to set themselves in Paris in 2015 and later. Dr. Patak was associate professor and head of the doctoral program at, uh, at the CPCT Univers University in Ahmedabad before joining uh, Ahmedabad University. She was also one of the drafting authors of the IPCC special report on global warming, 1.5 degrees Celsius that has come out and the IPCC special report on climate change and land. Her publications focus on low carbon scenarios for India, demand side mitigation actions, and their interlinkages with sustainable development groups. Dr. Patek has been a visiting professor at Imperial College London and has held visiting positions at MIT and at University Technology in Malaysia. Uh, We're extremely happy to have Dr. Patek here. Uh, she knows that she's speaking to humanist and social scientists. We are not scientists while she is, but we're much looking forward, Minal, to what you have to say to us this morning in Chicago. So welcome to Chicago and a good evening to you in India and over to you, Minal. Um, thank you for this very kind introduction, Dipesh, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm extremely honored to be here. Um, and especially thank you to Dipesh for converting this uh, chance meeting at Ahmedabad University we had a couple of years ago. Um, to this. And I also wanted to thank Frederick Arbitron North Johnson and Emily and the New Bar Collegium Committee, Mark and Caroline, for celebrating this. Uh, it's, um, uh, well, the page said in the introduction that I'm a scientist speaking to humanists and historians, and yes, all of you. Um, that makes my uh, task very challenging. I'm not a historian, philosopher, or political scientist. I've been an environmental scientist for quite a while now, working in the policy space. Um, uh, I, I have to admit, I'm nervous about this talk. So if I get into jargons or too many charts, please, please feel free to jump in and clarify. Um, my talk is uh, structured in two parts. Uh, in the first part, I will be talking about, maybe introducing a little bit about the IPCC and the 1.5. And in the second part, which is the more controversial part, I will talk about why, why I think that we can't make it uh, to this 1.5 degree target and what happens then. And that is further riskier because I would be keen to hear your views on it and what, how do you think we should, uh, we should be thinking about it. I mean, the title is a little bit pessimistic. It's also very bold. The United Nations has so far not said this explicitly, right? Um, we are not admitting it. I mean, there are a couple of writers who've said, said things in their books, and, uh, but, but we are not yet there. And it would be scary to admit that we won't make it because what happens then, it will be a collapse of the social order, I guess. Um, but, but let's see where we go with this, with this title. So Caroline, could I request you to start sharing the, the slide, please? Thank you. Can you go to the next slide, please? 
So this debate that I work for the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which many of you already know, is a UN body that assesses the science uh, of climate change. And the IPCC was uh, established uh, by, uh, uh, by WMO and UNEP in 1988. I think they're over 30 years old. Um, currently, it has 195 member governments. And, and we are tasked with producing the latest assessment on climate change. Um, so typically, an IPCC report reviews thousands of papers to come out with an assessment. Um, we run in cycles. So this is the sixth cycle of the IPCC. Next year, uh, the mitigation working group of the IPCC will publish its sixth assessment report. Um, and, uh, and, and each uh, the summary of uh, the IPCC report, the summary for policymakers is approved line by line. In this figure, you see a typical IPCC plenary and those giant screens there. That's where our summary is put up line by line and, and governments have to approve this for, for this to to uh, be published. And that's that's both challenging and interesting. I mean, IPCC has been criticized, you know, for many reasons, right? That, that it's inaccessible. And I will be showing some of those inaccessible graphs in a bit, not many, uh, I promise. Uh, but, but that, that we, uh, the governments uh, dilute the report at approval, which is not true. There are clarifications added in the uh, report during approval, but, but that's, um, well, that's the nature of the IPCC, right? We we do assessments. We're not we are not in the the business of uh, negotiations, right? IPCC's job is not uh, not to work out global agreements. It's just policy relevant. We we are supposed to be neutral to say what what could be possible, what could not be possible, with certain degree of confidence. Um, Caroline, could you go to the next slide, please? So uh, so when when the IPCC was first established, um, it was clear that, that there was some human influence on climate change. And if you see the first assessment report in 1990 and pay attention to the red, red font, which is the, the degree of likelihood or the confidence that IPCC had in its assessment, right? So the first assessment report said that unequivocal detection is not likely for a decade and emissions will rise one degree above the present by 2025. This was then, and it's actually happened now, right? The second assessment report said it was discernible human influence. Uh, the third assessment report came out in 2001, which says that it was likely that this was due to human influence. And the fourth assessment report actually came out quite strongly saying that it's very likely that this is due to human influence and that the evidence is unequivocal. In the fifth assessment report, which is the most recent IPCC report, said that it was extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause, right? And despite all the criticism, we haven't done that badly, right? IPCC did inspire, I mean, I would say, um, IPCC did spur several important global agreements, the Kyoto Protocol and Copenhagen. One can argue about the success or failure of these talks. But our biggest success was Paris in 2015, right? That, that when governments came together to agree on a, on a global temperature rise of two degrees and make efforts to, to, uh, to limit the global temperature increase to well below two degrees. Caroline, could you go to the next slide, please? So we were requested by the UNFCCC to produce the special report on global warming of 1.5, which I'm sure all of you know. And this was published or released in 2018. And I would say it was, it was very well received um, by media and by, by governments and, and, and by academics. And yeah, it, it, did, it did inspire uh, action and conversation around climate change because it said very strongly that the carbon budgets were shrinking and the available carbon budget was was just about a decade, you know, and emissions would have to fall very rapidly for us to, to make it to 1.5. What it also said was that it would require unprecedented changes in supply, in demand, in behavior. And it might also require what we call carbon dioxide removal, which is taking out carbon dioxide already emitted from the atmosphere. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? 
So this is one of our, our scientific uh, 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 figures. Uh, this shows the range of, so we, we look at future pathways. This one goes from 2010 to 2100. Um, and this is, uh, there are, IPCC works with scenarios and these are generated by models. Uh, these models take uh, future assumptions for societies like what will be the GDP like, what would be the population like, what would be, what would be, uh, let's say, yeah, maybe the energy supply system look like, right? And based on these assumptions, uh, several sets of future possible scenarios are generated. The 1.5 report, so this this band here shows shows the the portfolio of 1. Point. Can the slides be enlarged? Dipesh says. Mm. I wonder, Caroline, is it possible for you to do that? Not this slide, the previous slide, please. So anyway, while, while we are working on it, um, maybe if you can't read the text, I would just like to explain that these are pathways that reach 1.5. There are very many ways to reach 1.5. There are, you could change, you could, for example, if all electricity converts to nuclear, you could still get to, to 1.5 possibly. Or if we just completely stop consuming, you could still get to 1.5 or a combination of those. Or if you just continue to live the way you do, but, but capture all the carbon dioxide like in science fiction, um, you could still make it to 1.5. Whether they're sustainable not, or not is a different story. But but so these are the four illustrative pathways that the 1.5 uh, report talked about. Can you talk, go to the next slide, please, Karna? So I promise there are not too many of these charts. Uh, this one shows the four illustrative pathways, P1, P2, P3, and P4. And these pathways differ in their assumption of the mitigation portfolio. So P1 is a scenario in which there is, there is a low energy demand up to 2050, uh, even though living standards rise. The gray, the gray shading here is the fossil fuel uh, emissions. Uh, the brown is the agriculture, forestry, and land use. And the yellow, which you don't see in P1, but you see at the other other scenarios, other pathways is where um, CO2 is captured or um, sequestered to, to compensate for the emissions. So basically, uh, P4 is a scenario which is heavily dependent on fossil fuels and assumes a high growth rate. So you can see that in P4, if you don't reduce your emissions in the short and medium term, you end up with a lot of CO2 that might need to be sequestered or go underground. Uh, to put it simply, right? And, and in P2, which is a scenario which focuses on sustainability, you, you don't need as many net negative emissions because, uh, because the scenario assumes uh, human development and economic con convergence and international cooperation. It also assumes that people will shift to healthy living, healthy consumption, lower meat diets, etc. cetera. And, and so basically the point I'm trying to make here is that that the later you go in reducing your emissions from fossil fuels, the more likely you are to depend on, on carbon dioxide removal to take, take out those CO2 emissions or to compensate for, for the CO2 emissions. Next slide, please. So this is what I was talking about, that, that almost all the pathways that limit warming to 1.5, use carbon dioxide removal, some form of carbon dioxide removal, um, and it compensates for the difficult emissions. So, so like for example, aviation, we, we haven't really found a way to, to reduce the emissions uh, that, that are released from airplanes or flying, right? Um, and we already know that the methods for removing carbon dioxide include the, the more natural land-based methods, and, and the more technological uh, methods. The land base include basically planting trees, lots of trees, um, capturing carbon and storing it underground. So if you have a power plant, you take, take out the carbon dioxide and, and store it underground or from an industry or from a cement plant, right? So, 
So coal CCS plant would typically typically use coal and then the CO2 would, would go underground that way it doesn't emit uh, CO2. You could store carbon in soils, uh, you could grow bioenergy crops uh, and then, then sequester the carbon. So you're going net negative because the crops when they grow take up CO2 and, and when, when you store it underground you're actually going into a, a negative number there. Uh, and what I was saying was that the larger and the longer the overshoot over 1.5, the more CDR you need to, to bend the emission curve to 1.5. Next slide, please. So here's where I come to the more controversial part, right? Uh, do, do you want me to stop here? Did you need any clarification or should I just go on? Was there any question on what I just presented? Minal, quickly, can I? Tell the audience that if they have questions at this point, they can post them on the Q&A using the Q&A function. Right. And we'll take them up after your talk is finished. But people can start posting their questions oh, while they're listening to you, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, if anything was unclear or if you disagree with, with what I just presented, I feel free to just... Yeah, Use the Q&A function to... Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, um, so, yeah, I come to the, the meat of... The presentation that is if scientists accept that limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees will not happen. I've seen a couple of articles since I put this out, but not not a lot is written about it, right? Because because we are almost scared to admit it. Uh, what does it mean? And why why do I say why do I say that is is it time to accept? Uh, except that this, this won't happen. Although the 1.5 report actually talks about how you can make it happen. And most of my work is focused on how you can make it happen. How do you decarbonize buildings? How do you decarbonize transport? How do you reduce demand? How do you switch to renewables? And yet, yet I, I almost feel that, that we, we might have to accept that the overshoot or a large overshoot is inevitable. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, this, this chart talks about government action. The, the top, top gray band shows what happens to, to emissions uh, if, if the policies froze in 2005, if no climate policy um, happened, which is not likely, right? The blue band shows the current policy scenario. So, so if you assumed the same level of policy action, uh, what would happen to emissions? The red one shows the nationally determined contribution. So what have countries committed to? And where does that get us, right? And some countries have put conditional NDCs. For example, India says we could do more if we, if we were provided a financial transfer uh, or if we were provided technological support, right? But, but you see the green band here is where we need to go for 1.5 and the, the blue green band is the two degree. So I won't focus on the numbers, but, but here's the gap that, that you have between the actions that the countries have committed to and where we need to go. So it's a, it's a significant gap in terms, of, in terms of the actual emissions per year, right? Next slide, please. This is, this is emissions from, uh, this is also actually a CO2 emissions per year, but this, this one tries to show the, the effect of COVID. And COVID really shook us up, right? In every which way and not in a good way um, for most of us, right? Um, this one shows the last hundred years and COVID clearly was the biggest drop ever since the World War II. We've had the 2008 financial crisis, we had the oil shocks in the 70s, and yet COVID brought that huge dip. It was 7.6% if I remember correctly. And, and incidentally, the, the drop that we need for 1.5 is also around that. So like yesterday, the UN report that came out or the UN Secretary General said that that you will need a COVID every two years if you wanted to reach, to make it to 1.5. And that's why I say that a COVID, COVID every two years is not likely to happen. We don't want it to happen, not, at, not the way it has happened. If we can reduce demand 
in, in any other way it would make sense but but that's the so people pretty much stopped flying stopped traveling stopped consuming a lot um, all retail was closed and that's that scale of dip in demand is is what you need for for moving 1.5 next slide please um the carbon jargon right we are seeing a lot of net zero pledges by countries climate neutrality nationalism what are these and like is there hope um i'll tell you why there isn't right this is of course uh, china but but a few handful of countries have committed to net zero china came out with the surprise right that we will go carbon neutral by 2060 and um, caroline could you just click on all the bullets so that we have the content on the page so um so basically sorry go, go up so you need to drastically reduce uh, fossil fuels we know that by drastically i mean like 80 percent or something right um i talk, already talked about demand there are questions about how would you do it for like manufacturing, for example? We don't really have the technologies to bring down industry emissions to zero, right? And finally, you could always, you know, use the backup option. So all these net zero pledges are talking about about continuing with business as usual, basically, and and um, and falling back on removal options um, later on. And net zero is not zero. Zero is zero. You, you bring all emissions to zero, right? That's great, but we can't do it. So net zero is like, I'll continue to emit, but, but I will sequester in the future, or but I will pay a country to grow for us, or but I'll find the technology in the future, right? I, I probably don't sound as scientific, but that's the tone of the, the evidence, right? You don't have, you don't have the, uh, these options are not proven to scale. We don't know if, if, uh, if these could be upscaled to the scale that, that you need to upscale them to. Um, and also there's, there's the criticism, right? That countries are, are talking about net zero, but it's deflecting attention away from what they need to do in the near term. So they're not meeting their nationally determined contributions, but they're saying, oh, we will get net zero by 2050 or 2060, but we, we don't know if that will happen. We don't know if that is enough. And for a country that isn't able to meet up its present commitments, there is no, no certainty that, that it could be done in the future. So that's the other reason why I think it's not possible. Next slide, please. And I use this oversimplistic graphic, also generated by a fantastic communications team, uh, which shows that think of I think of CO two emissions filling a bathtub. So you have a tap, which is the natural emissions that obviously we cannot avoid, and then there's the human emissions. The, there is also a natural natural land and ocean carbon sinks, which have really worked very well, right? That's your natural cycle that that was in balance until the last two two hundred years ago. To, well, yeah, about that. And, and so if you wanted to, to make it 1.5, you have either to stop this step or to increase the rent here or to increase the rent here or all of them. And this one red is the engineered or negative emissions or natural negative emissions, which I already mentioned, right? That either it's by growing trees or by using technologies to, to take out carbon dioxide a technology called probably direct air capture, carbon capture and storage, DACCS, which is these huge towers, which these huge fans, which will suck out CO2 from the air. And you may have seen some photos. There's, I think, one experimental plant in the world. Um, next slide, please. So I talked about the scale of, of the challenge, of the scale of of uh, CDR that might be required, the scale at which you need to grow forests. Some, some studies have said you need land as much as three Indias put together, right? And, and you need huge amounts of water to, to sustain all of these, these systems in case you go the natural way. Uh, there's carbon sequestration in soil, but 
but that's not permanent. We don't know what happens um, after 100 years, let's say. Um, also, these natural systems are prone to, they're not things, they're not permanent things. They are prone to human disturbance. So if there is a forest fire, you could lose all the carbon you sequestered. And that would be alarming because it would happen all of a sudden. There's uncertainty about the, the natural climate feedback, right? We don't know if, if natural systems will behave the way humans expect them to. And that, that sort of ties to your Anthropocene narrative, right? Which some of you are, are working on. Uh, is that we are assuming that, that, that human godlike intervention will just work perfectly, but it's not necessary that it would. And I'm not even getting into the cultural impacts of, of such a change, right? Uh, there's ethical issues, which also I think some of you have written about, uh, about who decides, who governs, where does it happen, which country does it, right? There are people's perceptions. I was reading this paper about people's perceptions in the US and UK on CDR. And one of the people said that, I don't want my tax money to be used for funding research on CDR. There are all kinds of, of concerns, right? So. So uh, I think also Elizabeth Colbert in her book, Under the White Sky, which, which many of you might already know, she talks about how humans have set out to solve one ecological problem only to invite a new one. And how to solve climate, almost like the solution is worse than the problem itself. Or is it? Yeah, it is probably, right? Because we, we don't know what will happen with this large scale tampering, I would say, of ecosystems, uh, large-scale afforestation causing, competing with land for food, and assume a scenario where, where that actually happens, um, you are going, humans are going to prioritize food security and not really biodiversity, which means we'll decide for the species, we'll decide who gets prioritized, and then we know where the trade-off will be. So, in an attempt to grow monoculture crops, which is the same species, you are tampering with the local biodiversity, right? You're tampering with the species that existed there for years. And by species, I don't mean just trees, the birds and the whole ecosystem. And I already talk about, talked about the reversibility aspect of it. Next slide, please. We just can't plant more trees, as you talk about culture and I think I was just reading uh, who was that I think it's Ursula Heiss uh, from UCLA who talks about about multi-species and and the ethics and culture and the politics of of these decisions and there's all kinds of of decisions around the use of these these resources and Frederick I, I saw in one of your papers how you talk about scarcity and resources and how it's so much about cultural politics um, much beyond the environmental part of, uh, of the resource um, so we, we simply don't have the land like I cannot imagine if India had the burden of of afforestation beyond what it's already doing there's just no land there's just no land in rapidly growing countries it's, it's not possible Next slide, please. Uh, so, Debesh, in your in your essay on capitalism, uh, you say that that climate change is cannot exactly be equated with capitalism. Or if I have understood your essay correctly, you say that the history of climate change and history of of nature and its earth and systems is much older, and capitalism is is much more new. And you can't. But then, but then the fact of the matter is that that a lot of climate change problems have happened since industrial revolution or since like IPCC assesses basically from 1850. So my, my community actually just looks at that period when, when all of these, these events were happening at the same time. And, and I think Frederick's paper also talks about the Cornucopian view that we will find the technology and make it work. Um, I don't know what's, what's going to happen because because I just don't see that, that level of demand reduction happening. For example, the cultural responses to scarcity. I'm reminded of a Gujarati saying uh, from my part of, uh, of uh, the country. I'm Gujarati. 
and and my mother's grandfather used to say that i I'll, I'll quote in gujarati which is sangreyo uh, saap kaam aave which means even a snake saved will be useful and i i always found that weird like what what kind of a like what kind of a colloquial saying is that and my mom would explain that that it means that you should just save anything you just don't know when it might be useful and there's this culture too and it, it comes from i don't know scarcity thinking or where, where that kind of thing came from but we are we are losing it right the present day india doesn't doesn't really confirm and a lot has changed because of globalization uh, if i open my window i will see the growth of suvs and i only look at the data um, but then on the other hand there is the the need to develop to consume the questions of justice like the demand for cooling for example that will grow phenomenally high in, in a warmer world uh, because of climate change but because of income growth too like the air conditioner ownership in india i think just in cities might be about 8% i would just think we is to 40 50% in two decades it's just it's it's a necessity now not a luxury and though many people cannot afford it it's still going to grow because of the informal tax so so it's how do you how do you balance all these and i don't i don't see that happening what I, what i'm going to see what i'm i'm trying to say is that the demand continues to grow consumption increases and uh, and that that's why we just cannot make it to 1.5 next slide please and so this is my final part of the presentation let's see how we do on time not too well i would say i'll let me try and wrap up in the next 5 or 7 minutes dipesh would that be okay okay i i don't hear you dipesh sorry so sorry minal i was i was muted i just said shit and take your time yeah thank you So now I'm on slightly shaky ground because until now I was talking about the papers and the reports that I'm familiar with or or aspects of my work that that I know, but but now I I come to this part where I really want to hear also from the audience on on what this means for the future of the planet for for everything, right? What does it imply for sustainable development and all the conversations we've been having in the past? Next slide, please. next slide so this one is what we call the burning embers it's a it's a assessment of the ipcc and this talks about how global warming increases the risks in all these systems uh, when we cross 1.5 so the darker the color the higher the impact let's say that so the purple is very high irreversible impact the red is when you see a high discernible impact um the the yellow is when when you see risks or impacts which are moderate but but attributable to to climate why it is of course undetectable so that gray part here is 1 degree and each of these embers shows different um different ecosystems or systems right and the biggest impact or the strongest assessment we have is for the warm water corals where where if we don't limit to to 1.5 we pretty much lose all the corals globally and for 2 degrees we still end up losing most of them but not all of them um oh sorry i i meant the other way around yeah and and there will be heat impacts in so many parts of the world i come from a city where summer temperatures go to 45 degrees and i wonder why even an average temperature increase of of 2 uh, degrees what would it mean for for people who still live in informal settlements uh, we did a study actually a survey of 800 households and and we found and one of i think my co-authors is here to share here and and it was interesting because sure actually went with that temperature meter inside people's houses and measured the temperature and interestingly we found that in some of these informal settlements the temperature inside was more than the 
outdoor temperature because of the tin roofs, because of no ventilation, because of congested housing. And so many of these people, women, informal workers, who spend time in extreme heat and, and one just wonders what is the future for them. Yeah, most like this. We haven't, we haven't really, this, this is from 1991. We talk about discourses on nationalism, right? And um, George Bush famously in the Rio summit said that the American way of life is not for negotiation. And for successive climate negotiations, governments have been haggling over carbon budgets, who does what, whose responsibility, whose burden, future generation, present generation, poverty, equity, etc. And you know all these arguments. It hasn't changed. Well, now the question is, there's no carbon budget left to negotiate. It's just so small. The pie is so small that what do you divide and who gets what? So we can't now argue about carbon budget. So what are countries going to argue about? I guess, because nationalism has this thing, right? And as Yuval Noah Harari says that, that it's not possible for a country to solve it alone. So the, the best and the only strategy available is denial. And I think that the future discussions between governments will be around CDR and who pays for CDR and who does more CDR, who does more. I will just keep the blame game going as a way to take attention away from what we are supposed to be doing. Next slide, please. This is a very interesting paper from my super colleagues in the IPCC, William Lamb and Julia Steinberger, and it talks about the different discourses of climate delay, and they bundled this into this very interesting graph. Um, I'm not sure if I have time to explain all of this, but let me try very quickly. So they're talking about how, how we're using the arguments have become more sophisticated. So let me go at the top. So the what aboutism talks about people saying, Oh, I'm going to reduce my emissions. But what about countries that are not doing it? What about China? Um, what about India, right? And if you're in India, I'm going to say, what about my counterpart in the United States? They burnt all this. So the what aboutism is one way to, to shift the attention. The individual individualism talks about people's behaviors and governments can get away with saying that, that people should reduce demand, people should consume less, blah, blah, everything. But, but it's not, it shifts the responsibility to individuals, which is, which only is not going to solve the problem. The free rider excuse, somebody else will do it. Um, technological optimism, we talked about this, uh, that there will be a technology and it will take us out of the problem. Somebody will find that technology. Uh, the net zero, as I said, might be just all talk and little action. Um, I, I know government leaders and I don't want to point fingers, but going to these global negotiations and say, oh, we've done so much and we didn't cause the problem, so why should we do anything? Um, that the fossil fuels um, are really the solution and there's something called clean coal and it's just getting better, power plants are getting more efficient and it's not such a problem anymore. Uh, the carrots without sticks says that people will only respond to, to more positive incentives and it's, it's not, not a good idea to to impose restrictive measures and the appeal to well-being, the social justice and policy perfectionism talks about how people need to develop and grow and how 1.5 comes at this huge cost to jobs and workers and therefore, therefore you, we can't do it. And finally, the doomism that we are doomed anyway and climate change is impossible. I mean, the change is impossible, so we might as well live with it. And that's the scariest part, right? The doomism part. Then are we already there? Like, I'm just listening to myself talking and I'm wondering that, I, like I have a teenage daughter, she's studying in the other room. Do I want her to see my presentation? I don't. Because, because it, it will lead to kinds of eco-anxiety, which is already increasing in younger people. What What is the future of the world that that is, and that, that is continuing on, on this uh, present business as usual. Next slide, please. Um, interesting photos of uh, 
um, paintings that artists did. And I'm, I'm reminded of Benjamin Morgan, who shared a very interesting uh, presentation in Kolkata in India last year about how, how the arts uh, can play a role. And, and, and during COVID, a lot of uh, urban migrants uh, walked miles to, to reach homes because they lost their jobs because of the lockdown and they were just caught off guard. And the Peshi say very nicely that there are, there are no lifeboats for the rich, and, but, but, but it's also true that the, the, the poor will face the, the brunt of uh, climate change. And uh, Julia again says, it's not climate change, it's everything change. And, and climate will intersect with comorbidities of the Anthropocene, with the pandemic and with conflict and with scarcity. And it's, it's a cocktail of, cocktail of morbidities that, that humanity faces. And we're only talking about humans now, right? And Ursula talks in her book very interestingly about multi-species justice and we're only right now just talking about our own justice, but but um, I wanted to actually go on a lighter note. Um, in the morning, I was driving, driving to office uh, in my car on in the campus, in the university campus. When I reached, there was this monkey. There was this group of monkeys trying to cross the road. So there was one monkey. It was his or her turn to cross the road. And I stopped my car because I knew that monkey wants to cross the road. And the monkey looked at me and waited. And I waited too, because I, I, I was going to give the monkey time to cross the road. And I waited and the monkey didn't cross the road. So I drove very slowly and I looked back in the rear view mirror. And you know what I saw? <clears throat> the monkey crossed the road. You know what that means? The monkey did not trust. The monkey did not trust that I stopped for it or that I would not move, move him or her over. And that says a lot. If you brought all these species to the table, well, well imagine what time, like what kind of solution that, that might come out. I, I suspect that might, we might come to better solutions. Next slide, please. Um, I think I don't have, uh, I'm going to skip this one. Yeah, next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to talk about what happens if we don't make it? And that's an important question of justice for, for people in the fossil fuel sector and many others that might be affected because of this transition, the risk that this transition brings. We, we have made powerful advances in renewable energy, but we continue to invest in coal, uh, coal plants. And, and all of these will become stranded assets. They will have to close down, leading to loss of jobs or de-skilling, um, and new jobs won't become available as rapidly as, as old jobs will be, will be lost. So yeah, this is going to be a, like a significant economic impact from crossing the line. Next slide, please. This is a photo from the Titanic. Oh, it's just a photo I found from the internet. But but I, when I saw the movie, it was interesting. Like the ship was sinking and there were musicians playing. And, um, and in a way we are heading for the iceberg at full speed. We see the iceberg, we know we are, and it's almost like we're playing music. We're just waiting for that crash to happen or has it already happened? Uh, and um, I think um, Elizabeth Colbert talks about the trolley and I just likened it to the Titanic, but, but it's, it's really that in sometimes in conversations you feel like there's no urgency, it's just life as normal. I go to meetings and people talk about incremental change. How do we make buildings 10% more efficient? And you're like, oh, there's a fire in my house. 10% is not going to help us, but, but it's, like, it's like you're playing music. Next slide, please. Except that we don't have a Captain Smith of the Titanic to blame, right? We don't have anyone to blame. That's the, that's the difficult part of the climate problem. There are decision makers who choose or will choose, who chose in the past, these pathways that we are at. And each of these pathways are high resilience, low resilience, high risk, low risk. Uh, whether some of them have more resilience space, some, some have more biophysical stresses, some have less. And it's these choices that we have made 
I mean, it was a figure from year five, but I don't even know if we have so many choices anymore. And on this very pessimistic note, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to stop um, and to hear your views. I did have a couple of slides, but I don't, don't have to go through them. So I do hope it was relevant, but I, I'd be keen to hear your, your views on, on the slides. Thank you, Minal, very much for a bracing talk. I mean, it, um, but you know, it, as you said, it's not optimistic, but we have some questions already, and some of them uh, bearing on this question of optimism and, and pessimism. So I'll, I'll read out the questions one by one, and you can answer them as I read them out. The first one is from Neil Brenner, the sociologist uh, colleague at the university, asking, can you help us understand the land use implications? and broader environmental impacts of carbon capture and storage or carbon capture sequestration technology. So the land use implication and the broader environment impact of CCS. Is this technology only applicable in industrial agricultural settings or could it be applied in spheres of consumption that is in cities? So, do you think the use of such technologies undermines the urgency of the transition to renewable energy sources. Talk of CCS, does it undermine the speed of the transition? And do you consider them more viable based on your scientific expertise than geoengineering proposals? That so is a the, very loaded three questions, Neil. Um, I, uh, the first two are easier compared. Uh, I think the first and third are easier. Um, so uh, I didn't have a slide on land. I, I took it out at, in the end, but um, it depends on the, on the technology that you're talking about. Let's say we are talking about afforestation, which means planting trees. We can't generalize because it will depend on the context. So where it is applied, what is the condition um, of the land there? What is the species you're planting? What is the water availability? Um, what 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 is it in terms of the uh, available land and resources etc right but generally speaking land is limited and land cannot do it all that was the message from our land report so you have only so much land now you want to use it for energy crops you want to use it to grow forest to sequester carbon you want to use it to grow food or you want to, to use it for making roads and buildings so there are many implications uh, uh, land implications for, I lost the question actually. Uh, Do you want me to read it out again? Uh, no, I just wanted to see it if it was possible because there were two other parts to it. Uh, but but it, so the short answer to your question is that the, uh, the land use impact depend on the type of uh, intervention we are talking about. The more artificial and technological interventions like engineering based uh, technologies they don't have big land implications but they have other kind of impacts right they, they consume energy for example we don't know how those we don't know how much energy that will require to be powered and the land based mitigation options face limits and the there's already a criticism that that the scale of land that we are talking about is is not it's not possible it will lead to huge trade offs of biodiversity uh, in almost all regions. So there are going to so, be significant. So Neil, I think was also asking, Neil was asking whether the use of such technologies would undermine the urgency of the transition to renewable energy sources. So are these in conflict? The talk about carbon capture? And I mean, the renewable energy, uh, right. Uh, it is not in conflict and we, it's not an either or. I think we need all of it. So you'll need, uh, yeah, you'll need deep, uh, deep cuts in the energy supply system. Um, almost all coal has to be phased out and everything has to nearly go renewable. But you will also need, if, even if you did that, you will still need, need to do uh, uh, sequester carbon. Uh, but the earlier you do the renewable energy and demand side, the less the need you will have for, for carbon sequestration. So I hope and, I and, the, and I think that one, and one small part of Neil's question was, 
do you think this can be done in cities or is, can yeah is I this thought of, of yeah yeah i i don't know i mean like we we, we talk about nature based solutions in cities but but the context that i am in for example cities have no space there's no way we could plant massive trees and, and like yeah. a lot of a lot of these dense cities right there isn't there isn't land so cities won't be able to sequester huge amounts of carbon but but i would i would still say that there are other system and we shouldn't just focus on carbon alone right and there is a second question from kate which is very interesting but but it ties up to that that there are solutions which deliver well being benefits and we should try and balance those because it's not only about carbon so if you get multiple benefits then you should try to choose those uh, minal if you can, if you can see if you can see the question then if you don't need, need me to read out then it will save time for me not to read them out can I'll, you see the I question can, i can see the question and, okay then uh, why don't you answer it if there's a problem you can come back okay sure then mm -hmm. if you see kate's question so yes please okay. but you might I want to read eight. out the question I will yeah, read out the question. I will read out the question. I have eight minutes and three questions here, so uh, or six questions here. They're popping up now, but let me try go going one by one. Uh, Neil, your question about is all carbon sequestration land use intensive? Uh, no and yes. Uh, no, because if you're talking about um, carbon capture and storage underground next to a power plant so the the model is that there are empty oil wells and you use those oil wells to store the carbon so that probably is making use of of the land that's waste you could grow bioenergy crops on on wasteland so that would not be too bad but if you are actually growing monoculture crops in a water scarce area then that's a problem so like i said it, it's um, it's where it's done and how it's done that that um, besides the impacts. I have a question of Kate, a uh, shift yeah. to regenerative agriculture. Do you think a shift to regenerative agriculture is possible to help restore food security and biodiversity simultaneously? And by regenerative, I, I assume you mean, you mean more sustainable agriculture practices. So you mean a combination of tillage and everything else. And I, I would say yes. Um, I should have used my land report slides because the IPCC land report actually talks about all the questions that you are asking right now. Um, uh, yes, uh, sustainable agriculture, because agriculture uh, emits, I was only talking about CO2 here, but there are non-CO2 gases which are almost lethal for climate change because they, are, they have a higher warming potential and we have a lot of methane and nitrous oxide emissions from waste and agriculture, in particular rice and livestock and meat. So, so agricultural practices have a huge contribution to make in, in solving the, the global warming issue. And there has been a criticism also that we are focusing too much on the CO2. We should also focus on the land and the agriculture because there's a huge potential there too. So yeah, Kate, I would agree with that. And Julia, I didn't know you were on this call. It's an honor. Uh, we have only interacted on email. Let's see. Thank you for your work with Mark and me. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, it's bracing to hear you talk about the tension between your efforts with the IPCC, imagining the possibility of staying under 1.5 and your realistic recognition that this is unlikely. Could you reflect on the ethics of each course? Is it in fact unethical to keep talking about keeping temperatures under 1.5 or even 2? That's also a loaded question. Um, um, it is attention, so the, the, I accept that it's attention. I spoke with my uh, my boss this, this evening, and I told him that I'm going ahead with this talk, and and we are not saying it in the IPCC report. Our authors are not saying it, and I have I'm going to say this, and he said, "Go for it." Um, is it unethical? I mean, I don't I don't think so. Because, because my understanding of ethics is that if it causes harm, if not done, then also there is a problem. So if you say it, it's unethical, but if you don't say it also, it's unethical. So how, it's, it's just a question of trade-offs, right? Uh, in the sense, um, let, me, let me put it in a different way. Uh, if you, is it not unethical to, 
to give uh, a doomsday prophecy to the whole world and and that you might be might be causing anxiety to so many young people and yeah so many people everywhere and so i don't think i have a like a very good answer to your question but i i wonder if the page you wanted to try or julia if you just came to here to, to pass the floor to you if that was possible what do you think i maybe julia can write her answer while yeah do you want to move on? We've got a few more questions. Do you want to move on to Frederick's right. question? Yeah. yeah, I have Frederick's come, come question. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I have Frederick's question. Thank you uh, for sharing. And, it, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's trying to also actually, it relates to Julia's question, interestingly. Um, mm -hmm. so. Let me see what it says. It seems to me that much depends on how clearly we drive home the environmental basis of welfare and well being to the wider public, especially with the pluralistic framework that is open to many different cultural and ideological interpretations. True, rethinking conceptions of growth, moving away from the outdated GDP metric and narrow consumerism, shifts in generational opinion in the West are somewhat encouraging on this point. Thank you so much, Frederick. I do agree with you. Um, the question is, how do we do it? We know GDP is a poor metric, and, and I'm reminded of this interesting paper that one of my friends and colleagues wrote that it's called Keeping Up with the Patels. And Patels is a very common surname in India. And it's like, uh, her study was a household survey in Ahmedabad. And she asked people, what, what forms the basis of your appliance purchase? And they said, oh, because my neighbors bought it. And they choose, choose what to buy, what car to buy, what appliance to buy, because it shows a certain status. And in many developing countries, it's true. I mean, as a scientist, I feel this failure and it touches upon what Julia is also saying, right? That I'm saying it because I have no choice now. I, I think it would not be fair for me to give a talk that was all rosy and say, oh yeah, yeah here you can do all this for 1.5. I'm saying that it's very, very difficult. How do you change consumerism? I go back to the capitalism question, right? We have just flooded and, and the growth, um, that I'm seeing around me is just so phenomenally high. Uh, COVID brought that dip, but as soon as uh, lockdowns opened, uh, travel, consumption, everything was at its peak. And you know, like the top 1% of the rich in the world is, I mean, emit 50% of the aviation emissions. And there's inequality in uh, emissions everywhere. So how, uh, how do you change? Like, do you think that doing away with capitalism, if there was a magic wand, would would solve the problem of climate change. So it's worth thinking about, isn't it? So uh, yes. I think you've already answered Neil. So we might go uh, go along. Yeah. Oh, there's a Patel. You're talking about Patel. So there's Shorya yeah. Patel. <laughs> Shorya yeah. is my colleague. So uh, okay. I think um, yeah, he's going to say what should not unquestionably assume technology policy should not unquestionably assume that all technological progress is beneficial or that complete scientific openness is always the best. The world has the capacity to manage any potential downside of a technology after it is invented. I mean, what's Nick Bronstrom's argument in 2019? The problem, Shorya, is that, that we are cornered. We are cornered because now there is nothing to no argument to fall back on and and julia so we are not saying that we can't make it to 1.5 and therefore we are saying okay we'll make it to 1.5 we just sequester all the carbon and so while we kind of know the technological impacts of the technology we um we choose not to mention these i would say there's one from robert suits He's saying, mm -hmm. I'm curious if IPCC high emission scenarios account for geoengineering projects that aren't in that carbon capture. I'm specifically thinking of sulfur aerosols. I think about sulfur and its potential for unilateral deployment as a country like the United States could release the sulfur aerosols cheaply and without an international community. Do you think the cheapness and ease of deployment ultimately makes this or similar geoengineering projects more likely than others, e.g. energy reduction or carbon capture? Robert, thanks. I, I did have some, some notes on, on sulfur aerosols and solar radiation modification. 
which is you artificially put up a technology that reflects the emissions back into space and reduces the warming. Um, um, uh, the IPCC scenarios in 1.5 didn't account for geoengineering, okay, because there wasn't enough evidence for geoengineering for 1.5. But in this cycle, we do have publications that are talking about it. And there's a disagreement among authors. Some authors feel we should say it because it's cheap and it's possible. And some authors are still hesitant. So we'll, I, I, can't, I can't speak on the final assessment yet. Um, it is a supplement to mitigation, but, but it, it, no, it cannot substitute mitigation. For example, you can, you can deflect uh, deflect the emissions, uh, you can deflect the warming, but you can't, for example, geoengineering cannot look at the ocean, the impacts of ocean acidity. And there are, and we also don't know the impacts of sulfur uh, aerosol injections really very well. And the third argument is that who is United States to decide that? I mean, just, just saying it provocatively, I don't mean any offense to your question, but but that is a governance issue, right? Who decides what technology and how much? And what if something goes really wrong? But, but on, a, on a scientific view, it is that that is one of the options. It is one among that portfolio. Uh, we don't know enough about that, but we are now considering it as part of uh, the portfolio. So Minal, I have a follow-up. Sorry, sorry, finish, finish what you're on. saying. No, no, no go on. No, I just said uh, follow up question. I was going to go to Julia's point, but go on. Okay, no, I was I have a follow up question, which uh, you know, coming from both your um, answer to Robert and um, and what you said yourself, which is the governance question. So, does it working where you what you do and and where you where you do your work? Do you get the feeling that the UN is not quite the answer to the kind of planetary problems we're facing now, that the UN was set up to deal with global problems of a different world based on nation states. And with the assumption that, you know, with most problems, we have a lot of time in our hands. So, you know, if you ask, when will Kashmir problem be, you know, solved to everybody's satisfaction? When will the Israeli and the Palestinians solve their problems? The answer would be, we are trying and we'll get there sometime. Whereas I, I always think that the IPCC comes up with scenarios and with timetables for action. And the UN was set up for bargaining <laughs> for time, you know? So do you feel that, I mean, we don't have any other, any other instrument. I mean, the, the governance institution we have is the UN. And I'm asking whether it's time to imagine other kinds of governance institutions, sometimes regionally. You know, I think of the glaciers in the Himalayas and they, they service eight or nine countries, the rivers too, from Pakistan to Vietnam, you know, but the glaciers are all considered to be national properties, right? Mm -hmm. You know, glaciers belong in China. Yeah. So I often wonder whether we should have a regional authority to deal with the health of the glaciers or with the Amazon or with the, you know, North Atlantic conveyor belt, the oceanic currents. Mm -hmm. so, so do you, as part of IPCC, is there any discussion about the adequacy or otherwise of the UN as in as our kind of imagine the limit of our imagination for global governance or do we need to actively think about other forms of governance I mean, or is uh, there a governance deficit hmm, there is a governance deficit I would agree with that um, but I wouldn't say UN has only failed on climate change look at poverty look at human rights look at so many other issues but right? as I said those are all issues on which there's no fixed timetable See, that's what I mean with poverty. I mean, the dream of socialism. Socialists can go on fighting, thinking that one day it will come, right? One, liberals can say one day the world will be liberal. Democrats think one day everybody will be democratic. You know, so there are political dreams for which you struggle and you struggle and you remain optimistic because time, there's plenty of time. But here is a problem where, as you were saying, that we must go past 1.5 to 2 and it's from your bar charts, it looked horrible if you, if you looked at the figures for the for two degree rise, which is not impossible now. And so what I'm saying is that here, is, here we have an institution that we've set up for political bargaining between nations, which now has to deal with questions for which scientists are putting a timetable for synchronized action. 
And does that lead to a kind of governmental deficit? And are, are people thinking about it? In the IPCC, we are not because that's not our mandate. We don't discuss, but we do discuss sure. about the failure of institutions, but not the UN because it's our parent body. It's like going against your dad. <laughs> but just to put it very simply, but but on the regional, I don't. I'm not convinced because I've seen. Look at the Nile and the the water sharing, or you take the states of India and the water sharing. I mean, states are not able to resolve small problems amongst themselves. So I wonder, even if at the regional level. Would it even result in more conflicts compared to the global level? Um, I, I mean, I don't, I mean, the UN certainly hasn't been able to do what it was supposed to do on climate change or get countries together. And I have seen in IPCC approvals for the 1.5 certain countries objecting and spending hours. Our final session ran into over 24 hours continuous. We were sleep deprived and that country just refused to budge uh, because they didn't want the report to be approved. Uh, it happened with the land report with a certain country, with a certain forest reserve objecting to something we were saying. Um, and countries have their own interests, right? And that's why that's why we are not able, because it's too complex a problem to solve. Uh, it has just so many dimensions. And and that's why, I mean, if, if it weren't for the UN, what would it be? That's the question. No, yeah, no, that's not, I mean, that's, I said, it's the only institution we have for, to deal with global, global problems, but it, but I don't think when, when they set it up, they could imagine a planetary problem like this, which involves planetary processes, you know, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the, the hydrological cycle, we're, we're impacting on all kinds of planetary processes. And it yeah. was set up to settle issues between nations. Yeah. And now there are issues between humans and the planet, which is sort of uh, you, yeah, it's dismal how little progress has been made on at the COPs and how, like my. But we, but we got another question. I mean, there's Julia's sure. comment, of course. We can come back to it, but there's a question from a from a student, Eleanor Salter. Eleanor, thank you, and I agree. Eleanor's question is: Do you believe that the so-called race to net zero could be on the horizon between the China and the U.S., or is it just fiddly carbon accounting spin? too little, too late. Um, Eleanor, I will not comment on specific countries, but I, I will definitely agree with the second part of your question that it is fitly carbon accounting has been too little, too late. Um, because you could always, there are there are unsettled issues about the carbon embedded in borders, uh, in products that go across borders. How do you make those border tax adjustments? Should you do consumption-based accounting or production-based accounting? and the net zero, and when you say offsetting, who will offset? You have to pay some country to offset your emissions. And those are all very challenging issues. It is too late. It is too late, it won't happen. And finally, I have Julia's comment, uh, which says, yeah, we struggle with the ethics question. Should I say it? If I say it, what, what am I doing? And if I don't say it, it's not fair because I know the science. Um, there's one. There's a comment from Hillary Geller. Geller, not a question, Minal. It's an interesting. Yeah, Deepesh, do you want to read it out? Yeah. So it's not a not a question, Minal. It is ethical to tell the truth. Please continue to do so and frequently speaking to the public and telling the story of how great unraveling is the important work. Even if late, it can help us citizens to battle for a life-sustaining society. Thank you so much, Hilary. I don't know if you're a faculty or a student, but but I think we just need many more people to say this because you may think that everybody knows this. And Dipesh, when, when I was asking him about what how I should focus my talk, Dipesh said, you know, people know, people read, people know about all these issues. And while I agree for this crowd and for a large part of of course, the, yeah. The people I meet, the world, they don't know. They just go about, like I talk about the poor, but I also, of, of a large number of experts, governments, they don't know. They don't see the charts. They don't listen to us. They, they hear, they see, but they don't, yeah, they don't take it. In, like, I don't think my country thinks, I mean, the government got unsettled when a, like a teenager or a very young climate activist said something. And, you are in a country where I'm afraid to speak up, Julia. Um, I'm afraid sometimes to speak up and call out against the oil lobby. I'm afraid for the safety of my family. 
And I can say this while being recorded, that it's true for many countries. And that's, that's sad, but we, we have to say it, we have to be bold. Minal, before, you, before we end, uh, there, I don't see any other questions. I have one last question, which is again, thinking back to your, um, you know, the, the bar chart you had for the impacts, for the dangers coming from 1.5 and going on to two. And one of the points of danger we'll, we probably have reached with, if you go beyond 1.5, and I don't know when we will, or probably soon, is the unsettlement of coastal life and coastal communities. So which means we're going to have more climate refugees, both internally, right? People moving from the coast, say in India, people moving from the coast to inside the country, as well as people moving across countries. Whereas we are living in times where most governments have developed forms of racism, whether they call it so or not. Anti-immigrant policies have been on the rise, as you know, including in India. Uh, so this disconnect between what political thinkers are doing and the reality that you're trying to tell us about, I mean, as a citizen of India, as a climate scientist, how do you think about the disconnect? Because the disconnect is what what is all of us. I just push for strong science and now even stronger communication. I think many of my scientist colleagues are turning activists. I mean, I talked about Julia Steinberger and so many of us were just writing papers and we just realized that's not enough. And I'm speaking to school children and I'm, I'm writing blogs and stuff because I can, I can't, I can't influence my government sadly. The IPCC report doesn't change many things for many governments. And, and we just have to make, make fine scientific ways to, for a more just transition in the choices we make. Um, uh, the so migrant, we'll give, so, sorry, yeah. go on. No, sorry, just my, a very quick. Finish, no. Yeah, finish what you're on. saying. I was just going to say that the migration numbers were on in my notes and I didn't, I ran out of time, but Amitav Kosh puts it so much better than I do, right? In his books about how it will be a billion dollar industry. You have people yeah, across continents. And it's just going to be a, like a new world there, right? With scarcities and everything. And there are regions already experiencing these multiple conflicts. So migration is a reality of the future too. So I'll give the last question to your colleague, Shaurya Patel, who's back again with a question. Is it possible yes. that higher level of global warming could lead to less democratic governance structure in the future? So is global warming a threat to democracy generally? Hmm. That is global warming a threat to democracy? I think, I think we'll just go more, yeah, we'll go more and more uh, nationalist, I would say. And the, I, by nationalism, I mean the bad kind of nationalism. Bad kind. So, <laughs> I'm sorry to say it, but, but I don't have yeah, better words to say it. But yeah, countries will just close their borders because, because now there's no budget, like I said, to argue about. So right. it might be possible, Sharia. But I, I would, in a, an optimistic future, look for a more democratic society where people have a voice and where people make the change. And we could still, I mean, I, I said this, but... We still have a decade left. I'm saying that all this is not possible, but the 1.5 report says it is. And if by miracle we do all of those things, we could still make it. And we could go down in history as a species which just made that turn around in, in a decade. Well, on that optimistic note, <laughs> uh, we'll end today's proceedings. And Minal, thank you very much for being with us. It was wonderful to listen to you. And I think we need more people like you to come across and talk to us humanists and social scientists and um, oh, that we have one more question if you want to comment if you want to take it it's a comment from Margaret please that you want to take it before we finish I can take it yeah um, yeah sure. Margaret Leisure says I'm concerned that some of the solutions proposed for the climate crisis involve filling the environment with even more non-ionizing radiations or driverless cars etc yet the science is indicating that it's biologically active and will impact the ecosystem in addition to humans. <clears throat> um, let's let's just put it that way. Like I think we are we 
I mean, humans have generally responded to the most immediate problems. I mean, trying to solve what's here and now, right? And like for a for a poor person, is where will I get my bread today? And for a country, it's when what when's the next election? What's what's the priority? And therefore, I think right now, if climate change is such a big issue, then we are just trying to find all the solutions. And maybe these solutions will result in more problems. But like I think, I think people are thinking, let's worry about them later. Let's try and see what we can. It's not a perfect response, but I, I, I see, I think that's what's happening because also part of this driverless cars business and some of this is also linked to, to what companies are doing and linked to the, the capitalism and the private sector, right? That is, mm -hmm. it's, you can't separate these out. It will affect the ecosystems, many of these, not driverless cars, I think, but, but many of the solutions might. And I think we are, we are wrong in taking a myopic approach. Thank you, Minal. We'll make that the last comment. And thank you again for being with us. It was, it was, thank you for making time. I think it was wonderful to hear you talk, wonderful to have these interactions. And we're all enriched by what you told us, if also a little depressed about the state of the world, but it's better to know where the world is at than you know, not knowing at all. So uh, thank you very much. And maybe I'll wait for Carolyn to turn the screen off and make us all disappear. Thank but, you so uh, much, everyone. Yeah.